Well, it's great to have you here with us this morning, Frank. Um, for those watching who, who don't know Frank, this is Frank Castro. He owns a number of adventure luxury uh, travel brands. And today we're going to talk about Adventure International. So, um, Frank, maybe can you start by giving us a bit of your history and how you got into travel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I ended up living in Arusha, Tanzania, of all places, for about eight years on and off. And while I was there, I ran a high-end uh, safari lodge and then ended up getting into more of an operation side of uh, tour operating. And we started running Kilimanjaro climbs. And some of our very first clients were really big name uh, US luxury brands. And we were sort of the white label service for these brands on Kilimanjaro. So that was kind of how I got thrust into the travel industry. Uh, and then we went off and did really exciting things like mountain biking safaris, because we thought that was fun. And we thought, hey, could we actually provide this for clients? And we've done all sorts of wild stuff, like treks and climbs on different places, some stuff not commercially viable, but really fun. So uh, East Africa was a big focus between Tanzania and Kenya. We started operating on Mount Kenya as well. Uh, and then of course, you know, anything safari related, we started getting into, we would always try and put a little twist on it, make it more adventurous, like walking and things like that. And then cut to uh, in, in life, I ended up going out to Nepal and spending quite a bit of time in, in Nepal and thought that that was kind of the next frontier for us. So we set up shop in uh, Nepal and started running climbs in the Himalayas as well. And then we, to kind of finish off our little trifecta, I spent a lot of time in South America. So between Peru and Ecuador and uh, started our operations in Ecuador as well. So uh, that's sort of a little bit of my background. I've, you know, that's over great. a decade of, supporting people on adventure trips so yeah and I think it's that's really important for buyers to know that you you, you know you have the on the ground experience that um and you've been living in these places and you know it inside and out um and I, I will get into more detail now as we go through each kind of the the different areas that you specialize in yeah do you want to take us through the slides and we'll just chat as we go yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, we've definitely have been in that adventure, I would say like mountaineering, trekking niche for a really long time. It's stuff that we really thought was very exciting where we saw there was, you know, a little bit of a gap or an opportunity was really servicing that more discerning upmarket traveler who was very interested in adventure. So you don't find too many um, like luxury expedition companies. And so we've really kind of sat in that world um, and it's been, uh, it's been really great. So we've been able to kind of differentiate and stay in that niche. Um, and we do uh, a lot of local guides who, I mean, we do so much intensive training programs to really kind of have like the echelon of local guides. And also we do have a whole team of what I would call like expat or Western guides who accompany groups and clients as well. So that is possible. So we kind of have both of those models, whereas some companies only have the expat, some companies only do local guides. We kind of are able to merge, um, you know, whatever people are looking to do. So, um, sorry, I'm actually, oh, there we go. Um, let me try and see, okay, there we go. So one of the places that we definitely, definitely focus on uh, most of our business is Kilimanjaro. So we do a lot of Kilimanjaro climbs, um, privately guided, some set departures. Uh, we try to look for new routes. In fact, the park system has asked if we could find new routes. So uh, when COVID came out, they asked our company about COVID protocols. Um, we've really set the standard of safety on the mountain. Um, we got involved with KPAP, the third party that assesses if uh, companies are adhering to good porter practices. We basically pay the highest wages of any company in East Africa. 
So we are very, very involved in Kilimanjaro and very dedicated to keeping Kilimanjaro a safe place. So it's not really like a, hey, this is what we do and you're over there. It's actually about creating like a community of really top tier operators and amazing guides. So uh, there's a lot of times where- Yeah, you've been involved in guide training for guides who work for other companies too, right? It's not just about your guides. Yeah, that's- that's correct. Like wilderness first responder. So we'll hold that at our offices. Um, so, uh, yeah, so super involved in Kilimanjaro. Um, and then, you know, we will do things as like an extension, uh, after Kilimanjaro, like mountain biking safaris. I find this to be super fun and amazing. I mean, in fact, a lot of the people that do this are family. So there's a lot of families who go biking because kids in a vehicle for nine hours turns into a nightmare. So kids being out on a bike, seeing like Maasai kids in the village authentically, it's really, really fun. And these are all very well supported. So at any point, if anybody kind of gets tired, get them in the vehicle, they go to the camp or the lodge. So there's no roughing it. It's more about how are you spending your day and what is that? adventure look like and there's so many other amazing cultural and hiking experiences that are in Tanzania that are available so I mean too much to kind of put in this little presentation but there are really creative ways to do even a place as saturated as the northern circuit of Tanzania um, you know there is beautiful hikes and seeing culture like Hadzabe so I think it's just about getting creative with itineraries. And so, you know, we operate all that and essentially we're B2B. So tour operators, travel agents can hire us and we sort of operate that, right? Um, Then we operate on Mount Kenya, which I think gets really overshadowed by Kilimanjaro. Mount Kenya is absolutely stunning. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, there's There's not a lot of rules on Mount Kenya like Kilimanjaro. So we kind of self-police ourselves in terms mm-hmm. of overloading porters and, you know, trash in, trash out. So it is less regulated. So we actually kind of have to show up and really kind of like walk the walk, right? We do need to show up as an ethical trekking company because there's not, unlike Kilimanjaro that's highly regulated, there's not a lot of rangers and people walking around figuring this out. So There is a technical side to Mount Kenya. And so for people who do want to get into technical climbing, we actually do that. So uh, that's what we do on Mount Kenya. And there's a lot of more options on Mount Kenya versus Kilimanjaro. Like you can get helicopters and go fishing. Like you can go to Mount Kenya for the day and then pop off. Kilimanjaro, you can't do that. You got to commit to actually doing a couple days of a climb up there and there's a there's so, an easy there's an easier way as well up mount kenya right you've got the technical way and you've got an easier way too right yeah thanks there's a walking summit point lanana and then you have nellian and bastion which are the two technical peaks so if you just want to walk up to the walking summit super beautiful amazing um and then we actually uh through a sister company of ours we actually run our own luxury private tented camps in Kenya in the national parks. So something after Mount Kenya climb could be that we set up a camp, you know, uh, for a couple of days somewhere like like Kipia, where you can go biking and you can go on camels and you can do horseback and really cool stuff, which is really amazing in, in northern Kenya there or in the Maasai Mara to see the migration. So that's a that's a possibility after. And these are Mount these Kenya. are mobile camps, so it's 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 um, legal. Yeah, that's correct. And, they, and you can basically choose where to put them at different times of the year based on where the migration is and that kind of thing. Yeah, and these are private and exclusive, so these aren't set up. These are only set up for your group or party. So these aren't set up for the season like the traditional camps that are set up around Kenya. So super private and exclusive and Mount Kenya, get on a helicopter, get, you know, dropped off at your private camp with the staff. I mean, it's kind of like the ultimate in Africa, right? So it's pretty, right. pretty awesome. So um, we do uh, Everest Base Camp, and then we also do a lot of the peaks around Everest Base Camp. So for folks who are maybe not ready or 
you know, Everest is really not for them. We do some of the peaks that are really doable around Everest Base Camp. And there's ways to combine going to Everest Base Camp with climbing some of these peaks. And so that's really, really beautiful. I mean, I can't say enough about Nepal. So uh, there's so many variations of hikes that you can do in Nepal. So what we focus on in Nepal primarily is really having like full service treks. So a lot of companies, what they'll do is they'll just put clients at sort of the normal tea houses, which is fine. They're very charming, but you know, in all respect to just kind of what's happening there is sometimes the hygiene levels aren't as high. So what we do is we'll, we'll bring our kitchen team to take over the cooking and that way we can control the hygiene. So because what you find a lot in Nepal and some of these long treks is people get stomach bugs all the time. It's kind of a thing. You kind of like talk about how's your stomach doing on these treks. So not to get too crass, we won't go into poo talk, but you know, that's really what happens is the hygiene. So our kitchen team services, there's also a lot of variety in our menus because sometimes the food after day 15 could be like the same thing. We do little tea breaks, we do little snacks. Um, and then the camps that we do are really high specification private camping. So there's ways that we do different treks where we get off the main trail and, you know, kind of set up our camps and do some acclimating. So that's kind of how we do uh, Nepal. Like I would say like a really like higher end version of Everest Base Camp and trekking. Uh, and of course, using helicopters. So helicopters in Nepal is a way to skip out on, hey, hiking down for four days get in a helicopter, very readily available. In Nepal, um, through our sister brand, we also have a safari camp that we set up in the jungles of Bardia National Park at the Baobai River. So we've got a private concession granted to us by the military. And what's really beautiful about this area is that there's like nobody there. So you will literally have this camp along the river that animals come to drink at the river. There's things like elephants, there's things like rhino, and there is tigers. And so this is really exciting for us. We really feel like we are part mm -hmm. of stewarding this very vital corridor of wildlife between India and Nepal in Bardia. And so yeah. for people who are interested to see big game, it's mm -hmm. a very neat way to see that. And so we get to this place either by scheduled flights or by helicopters. I was just in Bardia, as you know, and um, it's an incredible uh, success story for tiger conservation, I believe, that they've doubled the amount of tigers in the last 10 years, which no one else um, has done that um, was trying to do that. And I think it's an incredible area where conservation and community have, have come together. So as, as well as the the actual national park, the communities around there are really interesting. Um, and the whole story around the conservation, I think, is fascinating too, right? I think it's really this whole concept of like jungles and tigers in Nepal is very underserved. It's kind of like an afterthought for people. And to be honest with you, until I spent a lot of time in Nepal, I had no idea. I was so Africa wildlife focused. And then, of course, I was like, oh, I guess you could see tigers in India. So Nepal was really under the radar. And then as soon as I started having full on tiger sightings in Nepal, I was like, wow, this is for real. This is like happening here. So places like Chitwan have been a little overrun. So Bardia in particular is like you said, a very, very special place because I and feel for, like it's not overrun by tourism. No, and and I think, you know, for people who maybe don't have the budget for, for Babai River Camp, which is quite unique and, uh, and obviously has a higher price tag due to the logistics and where it is and you know how it was <clears throat> set up but there are lots of other options that you can work yeah. with tiger tops there are other smaller lodges and glamping sites so lots of lots of options for people it's not that they have to go um you know to bob to bye bye right yeah yeah you're right so this camp is private and exclusive so kind of sticking with our model of how we do stuff in particular but yes, if you can't, you know, afford to do a private exclusive camp, there are other permanent lodges. And I will tell you, there are itineraries where we will do our camp for a few days and we will go to the permanent lodge like Karnali or something for like a full jungle experience in Nepal. So we right. do work with them as well, for sure. 
Um, we do uh, focus on Okankagua in Argentina. And so for people who are looking to kind of dabble into that seven summits world of peaks, Okankagua is a really great step after Kilimanjaro because Okankagua is essentially still hiking to the summit. So you don't need ropes, you do need crampons and ice axe, but it's kind of like, hey, I did Kilimanjaro, now I'm gonna do Okankagua as my next step, get the ice axe and crampons before I get into doing any rope work, okay? So Okankagua is one of the seven summits. It's the biggest mountain in the Western Southern hemisphere. So it's quite an accomplishment uh, for sure to get up there. It's a, it, the expedition is around 15, 17 days. So it's a little bit of a commitment. Um, but what we found is, is that how could we do Okankagua differently? So this, we do private guided. Um, we have an expedition partner for all of our like main tented options on the mountain, but we provide like porter support. A lot of people don't do that. Like we really start to stack up a lot more staff and support, which is very different than if you just go online and book an open Cogwood climb. So our climbs are definitely way a lot more supported um, so that clients can really just really kind of go as easeful as possible to get to the summit. So in Argentina, um, there's so many amazing things to do and so many extensions to go from here. Like there's Patagonia, you can go wine tasting. We, you know, we do biking in Argentina. But really, because this expedition is so long, a lot of people really do come to focus on Okankagua and then they kind of like head off to, to go do something else. Um, in Ecuador, we focus a lot on what we call the avenue of the volcanoes. Maybe people have heard that term. What that means is essentially Ecuador has a very unique geographical sort of setup, I would say, outside of Quito, there's literally this highway where you hit some of the biggest volcanoes really on the planet and they're all right near each other. And so it's very rare to be in an area where you can climb all of these really high um, you know, peaks and volcanoes and literally they're like a day or two apart. So what you have is essentially this avenue of the volcanoes where in a short amount of time, you really can um, get your trekking and climbing skills like to, to good use and to practice. So I would say that in the world of, you know, climbing and dabbling into mountains, Ecuador is like a beautiful playground to explore because now in Ecuador, you, aside from your uh, crampons and ice axe, you start getting more into rope work. So that's when you start practicing like, oh, I'm roped up to my climbing partner. Oh, I'm roped up on this section a little bit. All very doable. We're not talking about like, hey, I'm like in the next caliber of like rope work. It's all very, very doable. So there's peaks like Cotopaxi in Ecuador that are climbed by a lot of mainstream folks. So um, these are all peaks that are very, very doable. Um, Ecuador is absolutely beautiful. You can accomplish a lot in terms of trekking. And honestly, if you don't want to go to the top, there's all these beautiful treks just circumnavigating a lot of these peaks. And there's haciendas. And if you want to get into rafting and canyoning and you want to get into horseback riding, it's just stunning. For me, I really love Ecuador. I think it's just like the biodiversity is through the roof here. So, um, we focus a lot on Ecuador. And then, you know, we'll do things like private villas on the Galapagos with like private yachts and privately guided. So different from what, you know, um, some of like the bigger cruises do, we will do privately guided Galapagos uh, travel where you kind of hop between islands and you still cover a good amount of ground, but it's definitely a lot more private. So um there are private villas now and again you know using private boats that are just staffed for you and having lunches and doing all sorts of stuff on the galapagos like snorkeling and diving and biking and hiking i mean there's so much to do on the galapagos so we find these privately guided active trips to just be 
a good way to to surf. I was just down there actually, and I was surfing. I did a surf trip in the Galapagos. So for people who are interested in surfing, it is like untapped. I was surfing empty lineups, beautiful waves, eating like ceviche and like sashimi on the boat. It was epic. I mean, really, really epic. So, um, so we also have a team in Chamonix. And so we do some Alps trekking and climbing as well. So for those folks who are interested in hiking up to Mont Blanc. So this is something that we also find people who are looking to, you know, keep developing their trekking and climbing skills. The Alps out of Chamonix um, is an amazing, you know, sort of playground as well. And there's other things out here. There's Hout Route, uh, Switzerland. There's Tour de Mont Blanc as well. So um you know there's a, there's a lot to do in this area in terms of in terms of climbing and trekking um so yeah we have gotten involved in basically preparing people for the seven summits so i would say that for folks who are looking to do the seven summits or preparing to do the seven summits we will lay out like full multi-year programs for people to go ahead and do that so um that's definitely something that we're involved in. So for folks who are like seven summits, there's basically Denali in Alaska, Mount McKinley at the peak. And then there's also Elbrus in Russia. We kind of just had to cancel a group to Russia right now, considering what's going on, but that is one of the peaks out there. There's Vincent in Antarctica. And, and then of course uh, there's Mount Everest. So I'm basically just talking about the seven summits, folks who are interested in training and, you know, we've been developing programs and there's been a couple folks who uh, were interested to actually do the seven summits. And so it's a, uh, it's a lot, you know, it's basically like you've got to train for certain peaks and then you're going to go climb certain peaks. So it's a very mapped out um, couple years of, of getting this done. So we were That's already okay. kind of in that wheelhouse and then we yeah. just decided, wait, why are we just not doing this? We're already doing it for people anyways. So. So you basically take you can take people through the full training and actually then operate the seven summits for them. That's that's pretty incredible. Yeah. 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 And I know that you've also because you of your real expertise, you and your team and your knowledge, you know, I mean, I know it's it's a lot of ground to cover, but you also kind of are very creative and have designed some really kind of uber private luxury expeditions as well right I know you probably can't give too much away but um, can you give us a sense of if people have got really high-end clients that want to do something you know yeah I mean I, I think it's uh, you know when people are like budgets no option type of stuff it's just about oh well now I can get to an area in like a private plane or a helicopter or what can we book that's like really different and private? So an example would be uh, there were clients who uh, wanted to do something very different in Patagonia and do like fjords and checking that out. And we had access to like a private catamaran that actually with a private chef that could sail and go check out the Patagonian fjords. And then we would take them into Patagonia and do like a privately guided, you know, trek in Patagonia. So getting creative, you know, when pe I think that really it's about creating that like intimacy and privacy and exclusivity. That's where all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's where my money is going to, right? Is like the privateness of this experience. So, you know, things like booking private villas and access to different concessions where you're not going to run into 100 million people and and things like that so yes and i as, believe you've yeah. even kind of designed uh, mobile glamping at the top of mountains and things like that and and always with safety as a priority and leave no trace as a priority and you know i know some of these things probably sound high impact um but i know that it's very important to you as well that these things are done with um you know concern for the environment and the local people etc well that's kind of the thing right as you set up a camp it actually when you take it down it moves right so and of course you kind of leave no trace right so yeah i mean like eco camps and glamping setups in switzerland 
um, you know, Bolivia and things like that. So, um, you know, sky's the limit, really. Sky's the limit, of, yeah. If people have budgets, yeah, we can mobilize this. And then what's in the area to access like amazing adventures, you know, so. Perfect. Well, it's been great to talk to you. And, and for any buyers that are listening who want more information, obviously you can contact Frank and set up a meeting. Also, we have um, sales toolkits and we'll also be doing a long, um, a separate talk just about Kilimanjaro and another talk about um, adventure portfolio, which is more on the kind of glamping and softer adventure style trips that Frank and his team can offer and you can get access to images videos on the squirrelfish platform so anything you need just get hold of me or frank and we'd love to support you further thanks again for your time today frank thanks becky really appreciate it